Good evening, everybody, dear ladies and gentlemen, directors, eminences, and especially dear Matthias Lehmann, speaker of today's forum's evening. Some weeks ago, during the opening session of our second step of research as part of the second funding phase of the Kater Hamburger Center Law as Culture, I allowed myself to remark, though self-quotation is always a little bit embarrassing, excuse me for that, I have no other choice for this time. It is the basic premise of the Kata Hamburger Center Lawyers Culture that law cannot be looked at using only a juristic lens, but must also be seen through the eyes of the humanities, especially the Kulturwissenschaften, unfortunately not entirely congruent with the term cultural studies. The law as culture paradigm, as we call it, praises an enlarged concept of the law, including symbols, rituals, organizational structures, and narratives that go beyond the normative scope of decisions and statutes. It proved, too, that a relationship with the religious field is fundamental for understanding law as law likewise competes in modernity for <coughs> scarce resources to be untouchable, even sacred. The universal observation of globalization does not exclude the legal sphere, rather law holds the potential to heal some of the consequences of globalization, might be a topic for you, and even create new ones. Conflicts of legal cultures resulting from the spread of a ju judicial scape beyond the nation state is crucial for understanding today's world. But without relating law to aesthetics, uh, uh, several inner juristic items of the legal system, such as questions of style and the beauty of a decision, might remain unremarked and the symbolic power of the representation of law in marbles and stones on, uh, on canvases and installations intended to strengthen the force of law might be underestimated. However, the irritating question remains whether a cultural turn in legal studies might not promulgate culture as a normative argument, allowing for cultural defense, cultural restraint, and the cultural founding of legitimate and legal differences regarding the decision of what is right or wrong for a whole society. But what about economic life? In this context, Matthias Lehmann is raising his <coughs> questionnaire. He holds that over the past years there had been deep uh, divisions, not only between developed and developing or emerging countries, but also between the United States and Europe and even between European countries themselves. Many of the divisions concern social issues, as you said, so, such as the regulation of gay marriage, abortion, genetic research, in vitro uh, fertilization or surrogate motherhood, where some of uh, in, in this uh, round in this circle are specialists for those uh, questions. The link between these problems and specific traditions, beliefs, conditions, hence to what might loosely be called culture as you said, is evident. No surprise of that connection. But is it true also for that rational field of economic life that according to some economic theories is completely expelled <coughs> from the explanatory scheme of economic action into the randomness of contingent social and cultural factors. More remarkable, therefore, seem to be the divergences emerging with regard to the regulation of the economy, an area supposedly dominated by strictly rational and almost mathematical thinking in some uh, perspectives at least and some theoretical approaches in economy of, but the most dominant ones today. But is it true an illusion as Bourdieu might say or an ideology with regard to the real facticity of cultural impacts into the economic sphere? Matthias Lehmann seems to be particularly apt to answer to those questions and beforehand to ask the right questions. I won't run through your CV. But you studied law and at the University of Vienna and uh, you were part of a, a postgraduate course Droit des Relations Économiques Internationales at the University Pontion Assas, 
and also the other steps have to do with the fact that there is a very broad socializing, uh, socializing and socialization phases in which different legal cultures were not observed only from the outside but have been mm. learned and lived with uh, in the real context of living law. So, uh, for example, you had uh, been your uh, doctorate on the subject from conflict of laws to global justice uh, from 2009 to 2014. You were chair of German and European private law, commercial and business law, finally Europe, uh, at, uh, and director of the Institute of Economic Law at the University of Halle-Wittenberg since October 2014. He is, fortunately, director of the Institute for Private International and Comparative Law at the University of Bonn. And since October 2018, uh, you are fellow at the Kater Hamburger Center Law as Kachen. So what is really wonderful to have a look into the list of publications that are important in order to have a first access to an author. And it is, this is really fascinating. I can't, of course, neither read nor analyze systematically, but to see that from, from a Grundriss des Bank- und Kapitalmarktrechts over Finanzinstrumente vom Wertpapier- und Sachenrecht zum Recht der unkörperlichen Vermögensgegenstände einer Habilitationsschrift, die in Tübingen einem merkwürdigen Ort publiziert worden ist, es müsste bei Morsiebeck gewesen sein, wenn ich mich recht erinnere, einer Zitierfibel für Juristen äh, in zweiter Auflage erschien und dann schließlich auch die Schiedsfähigkeit wirtschaftsrechtlicher Streitigkeiten als transnationales Rechtsprinzip, die Dissertation aus dem Jahre 2002. Es gibt eine unendliche, da hat man ein erstes Bild. And then there are a lot of editorships uh, around uh, the main uh, fields of research uh, that Matthias Lehmann is representing, and those are common European sales law, uh, that is also Gemeinschaftsprivatrecht, that are un, uh, uh, unkörperliche Güter im Zivilrecht, hedge funds and private equity, etc. So we know a little bit that bank law, financial instruments from a legal perspective uh, are interesting and are the topics he has worked <coughs> on. But please allow me to uh, remind you, however, some other fields. For example, l'espace de justice à la carte, la coopération judiciaire en Europe à géométrie variable et à plusieurs vitesses in droit à l'épreuve des siècles et des frontières. So this means that there is a really enormously wide range of publication in French, in English, in Spanish, and in other languages. Of course, the Rome I uh, order has been part. Um, also, more generalized questions of the, as the question uh, of Rechtsfähigkeit in ACP, 207, 2007, uh, and a wide, enormous wide range of publications. Something I would like to read also, Le loyer en droit comparé un aperçu. Uh, most of us would like to know more about this because we sometimes have to rent a house and an apartment and would like to be better informed. But this is not the main purpose of comparative law to have a better standing in this difficult world when we are going as tourists or as professors around the world, but it has to do with a deeply <coughs> uh, entrenched uh, way to question our idea that our national law would be the only one one could imagine uh, comparative law tells us another story and this story will be told also in a field where we think rationality would claim for its way to be regulated by itself but is it true we listen to your talk thank you very much for being with us and uh, let's have a good time
thank you very much for the very, very kind introduction. I have to say too kind. I feel almost a little bit ashamed. And um, I, I feel all the more modest today because I'm only a lawyer. I have no training in any other social science and humanities, nothing. Uh, a little bit of economics, but that's about it. And uh, different languages don't really help me to cover that gap that I have and I wish I had had the opportunity to spend more time with you here at the Institute to get more acquainted and know more about other social sciences but for many uh, different professional and private reasons I was not able to to be here as much as I as I wanted in the past term so every um, and so please excuse since I'm only a lawyer if uh, the ideas that will come up will seem simplistic to you, um, unfounded from a socially, social science perspective, and I'm happy to, to get any input. You know, this is like a, a, a first test run. Um, what could be improved or where there are uh, major mistakes? So every research starts with a research question, something where you where you are simply perplexed, where you don't know the answer. And uh, my research question was and is, <coughs> why are Western systems, Western states, what we call the Western states, uh, but sometimes even not only includes uh, North America and Europe, but sometimes even includes Japan as a Western system, um, why, if they all are called Western or capitalist, why are they so different? And that's the first thing that we have to agree on, and not everybody will agree with this, I'm sure. But I think there are profound differences between, for instance, the US and Germany, but also between Germany and Switzerland, or Germany and the UK, and then again between Switzerland and the UK. And that has to do something with, um, you could call it the style, you can call it the way of thinking, um, the attitude, the behavior, or the culture, I think. Um, whereas we see lots of innovation in the US, an openness to in innovation, uh, innovation is really embraced, where you see um, a culture of big companies, big companies are not seen as anything bad, um, where you see also a behavior of risk-taking, that seems alien and even strange to us. In Germany, we have more a tendency to focus on uh, manufacturing, producing tangible things. We focus on small and medium enterprises. Switzerland, not so far from us, is similar uh, in that they also have a, a well-known manufacturing uh, industry with high quality products, but they have m a much more important financial industry, of course. And then the UK, um, today completely, almost completely de-industrialized and after Brexit probably totally de-industrialized service industry and uh, focuses on finance. That is one side of the medal. But there is also another one when it comes to inequality. The Gini index measures income disparity and there you see <coughs> that some countries, I was surprised, for instance, to see that Brazil is really um, the country with the highest income disparity in the world, followed by Mexico, but then uh, closely behind is the United States and China. And then if you look for Germany, we have a rather, although we always feel that we have more and more inequality, and probably there is a point about that, we still have a very decent G index, and the best, uh, of, well, not of course, but must be a Scandinavian country, is Norway, where they have um, less inequality than any of the other countries. Although, and that's a fascinating thing, they have a, a developed um, capitalist system as well, right? So why is it that some countries have this type of capitalism and why others have this type of capitalism or even this type of capitalism? That's the basic um, question that I'm asking. <clears throat> and there you can say, of course, this has something to do with politics and it's, um, it changes over time, but it doesn't change that much. 
or you can say it has something to do with the structure of the economy, but I am convinced that regulation has something to do with it. Um, so, what is regulation? Why didn't I just say law? I think law is a little bit too broad in that matter, because law that encompasses everything, um, including basic ways of contract law, whether you enter into a contract by a offer and acceptance or whether you need more requirements, all of these things that are also cultural, but I don't think that they really influence, for instance, income equality or the, the structure of an industry. What I think is much more important for um, the state of an economy is the way in which the state interferes in the economy and the state does that by regulation. Now regulation can be legislation, like law, it can be acts of regulatory authorities, like uh, BaFin in Germany, or EBA and ESMA on the European level, or the SS SEC in the United States. But in, in my definition of regulation, regulation can also be done by judges. Sometimes the judge takes on the role of a social engineer, I think Holmes said that, right? It's judges as social engineers and <coughs> they regulate a whole industry or they regulate a part of life. Now what's so different about law and regulation? Isn't that essentially the same? And I'm asking constantly myself this question, but I found something interesting in Foucault. You always find something interesting in Foucault uh, because it's always um, so, how should I put this? It's so, so generalized, but at the same time so pointed that you think you understand it and, and you think you can use it for your own talk. So I use this part, uh, the idea of um, governmentality. Governmentality means that uh, this idea that um, in the, until the 16th, 17th century, um, sovereign, well, the basis of the law, the focus of the law was to maintain sovereignty of the prince, of the king, over a certain territory. And uh, the goal was obedience to the law. Now, after or with the 16th century, this changed and um, the sovereign started to think about the population in economic terms and about the well-being of the population and the sovereign started to interfere with um, the different ways of life um, in a very uh, well micromanaging manner uh, and Foucault compares this to um, a father running a household uh, when you when you run a household you don't just set general rules of law um, as a king would as a sovereign but you interfere with the smallest details to achieve certain goals, especially to increase wealth, to save money. And this is what he thinks what characterizes the state, the modern state. And I think I agree very much. The modern state is no longer, for the modern state is no longer sufficient to just set uh, general rules uh, crim of criminal law, for instance, or of constitutional law. It interferes very closely with the economy because it wants to avoid certain effects or achieve certain effects. And uh, Mr. Gephardt mentioned uh, the example of my article on uh, renting and the comparison of rent markets and how it's done in different countries. And that's exactly what I, what I found out. Uh, in Germany, we have a very decent rent market because the state interferes very much with it. We have the highest protection um, that you can imagine when you're renting an apartment anywhere. And that um, means that we have, well, most of us are happy to rent, whereas in other states there is much more drive to buy apartments, to buy houses, which increases the prices enormously. Um, but then there is also a cult, what I found out in this article, working on this article, was that there is also a cultural element involved in this because in um, the Anglo-Saxon world it's a cultural thing to own your own house. 
right? Um, and uh, we don't have this. Now the question of course is, is that due because we have this rent protection or do we have the rent protection because we are a nation of people who are renting and we are a nation of tenants? I couldn't find that out but I had a hard time convincing my economic, my co-author who is an economist that any of this the mentality would have anything to do with this, right? She was just looking at the numbers and the graphs and saying, well, we have this and they have that, but that's a question of offer and demand. And I think now it's also a question of mentality, right? Um, <coughs> anyway, so um, coming back to governmentality, um, Foucault said, um, and I found that really interesting, he said, in, in um, the governmental state of the government, the modern governmental state, law uh, is no longer an end of itself, in itself, obedience to the law is no longer an end in itself, but law is more used as a tactic to achieve something, right? You use regulatory action to achieve certain goals like increasing the wealth or having decent housing for your population. And then something that struck me personally, um, but I discovered many, many times when um, I did research on banking is that this means also a battle of professions, right? Whereas we used to say, well, the countries are run by lawyers. That's no longer, I think, the case, especially when you think of the European Union. It's more and more economists who write, really write uh, from start to finish um, regulations, directives. And that's why these things are so hard to read for lawyers. Right? Um, it's, no, it's no longer pleasing to read a directive from the European Union because it goes into so many details. It's a, it's a kind of rulemaking that's totally alien to lawyers because it doesn't start with principles and then gives exceptions. It, it gives rules of what you have to do. Right? And that's um, governmentality, I think. So, what is regulation? If we agree that regulation is important, what is the goal of regulation? And here the economists have very clear answers. They say um, regulation must always serve to remedy market failures. Now, what can be market failures? Uh, economists would say when there are information <coughs> asymmetries, for instance, in consumer law, when you buy something and you don't know all the features, we have to regulate the market because um, the consumer doesn't know enough about it. Or when you have monopolies, uh, we have here in Bonn the uh, Bundeskartellamt, which is uh, responsible for fighting monopolies. When you have externalities, we also have in Bonn um, the Climate Protocol Agency of the United Nations that administers externalities to the environment. Or if there is a lack of a um, public good, for instance, if the water is no longer clean enough or the air is no longer clean enough. But I think, <coughs> this is all very insightful, but I think it's lacking something. The state intervention into the economy can also have other objectives. For instance, it can have the objective to protect stakeholders. If we think about uh, Germany, co-determination, Mitbestimmung, right? That is not to solve any market failure. The goal here is to involve employees in the governance of the firm. So get those on board who really have a stake in the company, not only the owners. We can have um, regulation that serves stability. For, in for instance, financial stability, but also stability on the housing market. We can have regulation that protects small and medium <coughs> enterprises because we want to have not only big businesses, we think that for certain local communities, for the geographic distribution of jobs, it's good that uh, we have small and medium enterprises as well. Think about sustainability, ethical concerns, the distribution of wealth, equal distribution of wealth in, uh, in the territory, and even think about maintaining peace. We say lots of times that the, Euro the, goal, the ultimate goal of the European Union and its single market is to maintain peace in Europe. That's sometimes strange for uh, non-Europeans, 
But the idea is, of course, by binding, by creating one single market, the economies become so intertwined mm -hmm. that, that war is no longer an option, and it worked pretty well within the last decades. <clears throat> so the economists, of course, don't see those things, or really don't. It doesn't fit into the, their models because they focus on efficiency. And um, I think what I really do is I have here some some quotes with the economists because they they are not really at at this stage of the development of um, of their science, they are not really able to take on board these cultural differences and the different values that we have from country to country. And you can see that one of the clearest expressions of that for me is <coughs> the doing business report by the World Bank. I don't know whether you have ever looked into this, but the World Bank does an annual report how it is doing business in each and every country. right? And um, here is um, the entry for Germany, and uh, we are not doing so badly, 20th out of 190, but also not so well either. And then they look for things like um, how, how demanding, how difficult it is to start a business, to deal with a construction permit, to get electricity, to get credit, and so on, right? But what they don't look at, what they never look at, is how stable is the country? How is the social cohesion in the country? How is the health service provided to employees? What's the corruption level? Uh, what is basically the rule of law in this country, right? Because that's not really that important for doing business. So they look at, at an economy simply by saying um, it's efficient to do business there or it's not efficient to do business there, but they never look a little bit beyond and say, um, what could happen? Um, is it stable? Is it sustainable what we are, what we are doing there? And that, I think, is, is regrettable. However, in theory, of course, even economists have um, looked at, at the, they were not completely blind to the fact that there are different rules in different countries, and they have looked for explanations. One of the most prominent ones who did this is Douglas C. North uh, with his book Institutions, Institutional Change and Economic Performance. And he um, talks about institutions, so it's already very difficult to, to find out what he means by institutions, but he gives this definition, humanly devised constraints that structure political, economic and social interactions. And interestingly, he includes in, into those institutions, which he calls constraints. Remember, constraints. He, he integrates law and regulation, but also culture. Culture, he says, is an especially sticky constraint because you cannot get rid of it so easily. It sticks in, in the country, and uh, once you are in there, it's very difficult to get rid of it. And also, what he is constantly, that's his, the point of the book, is... Um, how institutions, how law, regulation, and culture um, promotes or inhibits economic performance. What are the steps that a country has to take? What are the rules that it has to take over? What is the culture that it has to take on board to become um, economically successful? Okay? So that's a typical um, economist's view on, on, on the law, if you like. And he looks at it like as an evolutionary process. And in this evolutionary process, every country that wants to be successful ultimately has to adopt the same institutions. Right? And I would, what I take issue with a little bit is that he thinks of law and of culture as constraints. Right? Law and culture both can also build up and allow economic activity. There is no uh, economic activity whatsoever without law and culture. So it, I think it's a little bit short-sighted to call that constraints. Um, <coughs> and also, he thinks of the institutional ch change as being linear. Everybody has to, at some point, adopt um, the same rules on antitrust, um, on uh, insurances, on rent 
law, for instance. But I don't think that that's necessarily true because we have seen that the very different countries that are all economically successful but in different ways. So I think there can be different outcomes um, of development and very different types of capitalism. That brings me to the next uh, type of explanation um, by Hal and Solskice. Always have problems with his name. They have published a Soskice, Sorry, uh, they have published a famous book called Varieties of Capitalism, in which they distinguish two types. They categorize broadly all um, capitalist economies into two types. They are liberal market economies and coordinated market economies. So liberal market economies are basically, we can simply say, the Anglo-Saxon economies, right? They're liberal and coordinated. It's everything from Germany over Japan to China. Uh, because, and the, 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 the theory is, well, in liberal market, uh, companies really compete on uh, price, on quality, but in the coordinated market economies, it's more complicated, the state interferes much more, uh, everything is relational, you have to have contacts with certain persons, with, uh, with um, decision makers and uh, with other companies. So the idea is com companies in Germany and in the US operate in a very different environment. And I think I can agree with that. I mean, that's clearly they see there is a different culture, right? Um, and then they say, interesting observation as well, um, some countries may derive an advantage from their, from their institutional infrastructure. And they are not as simplistic um, as North was by saying, well, ultimately every, everything has to be liberal like in the United States. They say, uh, well, the institutional infrastructure in Switzerland obviously is very successful, right? As is the one perhaps in the US, but they never discuss really what is successful. Um, I, the problem I have with, with this uh, explanation is first of all it does something um, that I'm not so interested in it focuses on how companies adapt to this different environment so that's not their fault it's just uh, the way they focus their work but what I take more issue with is that they uh, think only in economic priorities and they say a country can derive competitive advantage by its type of um, institutional infrastructure. There can be other um, goals, like we have, sus I mentioned a couple of times, stability, sustainability, um, and things like that. And especially, they never explain really how these differences came about. Why do we have this type of, um, of coordinated market economy in Germany, and why does the US have a liberal market economy? So that part is then taken over by more uh, economists who had worked at the World Bank. La Porta et al. They're usually cited, La Porta et al. And they have published a series of articles, sometimes with changing authors, um, about legal origin. So legal origin, they really go into the law. And they say, and they link the law to the economy by saying, basically, common law uh, legal systems are much more successful than civil law legal systems. And then they look at, at legal features of, of civil law, for instance, the protection of shareholders in France or in Germany, and then they say, <coughs> shareholders are much better protected in the UK and in the US. And then they compare it with, um, with the gross domestic product of the US and the UK and they say, you see, France is not doing so well. It probably has something to do because of their legal origin in the French <coughs> tradition. Right? I think that's totally, that's really superficial and that has been criticized very much, of course, outside of the US. Um, it, in my view, uh, in this way really overestimates for once 
the importance of the law, especially of the legal origin. I don't think that it really matters for the um, competitiveness of your economy whether you decide by uh, the rule of stare decisis, the binding precedent, or whether you have the rules in the code. I don't think that that really explains why your country is more or less economically successful. <coughs> and um, also within the common law tradition we see very different um, economic success rates and also in the civil law system. Just think of Switzerland very economically successful, may I say Germany as well. And, um, and what is particularly striking is that what they say is better, how they measure what is better, they measure is it in gross domestic product. So whether, you, whether a system is good or not is measured in how much economic output you do per year. But that's not the, the whole story, right? First of all, you would have to look how much you make over decades. Is it stable or is it just boom and bust? And uh, also, maybe you should look at how is uh, wealth distributed after that and what kind of society you produce and who gets um, this wealth. So, all of this is, uh, was not satisfying my interest and um, that's why I, I got very interested when um, the Kete Hamburger colleague addressed this issue of law and economics and culture and I thought really there is something um, in which I could or a subject that I could research and that is first of all the relation with economics. Um, regulation as I already said is very much influenced by economists and most parts of regulation and they are very well, in, in, economi in economics, Anglo-Saxon thinking is absolutely dominant. Um, that, I think it's in no other discipline as dominant as in, as in economics, not even in music, because in music we at least sometimes hear German music or French music or Spanish, but in economics, German economics, uh, Italian economics is basically dead. All of my uh, colleagues from the Faculty of Economics, they all write in English and not only do they write in English but they take over all the concepts, all the thinking from the US. And <coughs> I've checked in the last 20 years there were 39 Nobel Prize winners in economics, so mostly they give it to two, uh, sometimes even three authors. And among those 39 Nobel Prize winners there was only one did not come, who did not come either from the US or from the UK. I mean, a U UK or US university, maybe different origin, but it's completely dominated by, um, by Anglo-Saxon thinking. The only one uh, who was not from the UK or the US was uh, Mr. Tirol from France, and before that we had one German who was at the University of Bonn, Reinhard Selten, of course. <laughs> But uh, it's, it's very dominant. And that re is reflected a little bit. I, I think we, we should also at some point talk about the culture of the economic science. The economic science today is dominated very much by a certain um, Anglo-Saxon culture. I, I'm, I'm just, I don't deplore it. Here is my, um, Ameri my assistant from the United States, Brian Thompson, who also helped me set up the, the PowerPoints. But um, I have to say, well, we have to realize that it's m very much dominated by American thinking. Just what it means um, for, the for the way in which the an economic science is set up. And that means it's largely blind to other values and goals than to short-term profits, efficiency, business ease. That's the, that's the things that, that matter most to economists. Now, um, I think, on the contrary, that you can also use regulation for other uh, goals that may reflect, in a way, the preference of a society. And societies may have other 
preferences or more preferences than just a high GDP or just um, big uh, profits. And what I want to do is to um, find out these other preferences, these other goals, these other values. And to do that, I'll, I'll, take, I'll try to take some uh, insights from, from other <coughs> sciences as much as I can. But my knowledge, of course, is limited. What I found very intriguing and intuitive and appealing for me as a lawyer who's uh, not very versed in the literature was or are the cultural dimensions by Gerd Hofstede, who is a Dutch anthropologist and who studies mainly business cultures. Business cultures. And he has this very... Um, these very nice dimensions in, with which he tries to categorize countries. It's a little bit superficial, I have to say, right? You cannot do it that easily. And, and not all of these categories are really helpful for me. So I still struggle with masculinity versus femininity, uh, what, what he really means by that. It's not that uh, male dominance or something like that. What he means by that is that a society, a society is more masculine when it is dominated by values as success in, um, in profession, um, profits, money, things like that. And, and it's more feminine when it also values other factors, right? Like uh, human relations, things like that. That's, that's, that's one idea. No gender bias. No gender bias, right. So I think there's certainly there's certainly some things that, um, that we can debate, but um, long versus short term in, um, orientation I found very intriguing, uncertainty avoidance, and also individualism versus collectivism, and just because it's so interesting, indulgence versus restraint is also very, very revealing. And now I'm doing <coughs> what is most, perhaps, no, it's not yet the most uh, risky part, but it's also very, already very risky. I do a little case study on ourselves, right? It's always um, the most interesting, but also the most difficult to judge yourself a little bit. So how, how does Germany fare on these cultural dimensions? And especially, and that's my approach, I want to, because I'm a lawyer, I'm a comparative lawyer, I want to do it by studying German law. So I'm sorry, I will have to bother you a little bit with with legal details, but it will not be too much, at least not at the beginning. At the end there will be a thing where you will really hate me, but at the beginning we start with the German Angst, right? It's, a, it's an English term. How, how do you pronounce it, Brian? Ang you say German Angst? Angst. German Angst. Okay. It's, it's, it has become an English term, German Angst, because we are angstlich. Okay? And how can, where can we see this? Is this true? Do we have objective Things? Yes, of course, if you look at the law, we have, we have the Vorsorgeprinzip in environmental law, totally not understandable to Brian. Vorsorgeprinzip means um, if there is a risk that there is climate change, but it's not yet proven, right? it's not yet proven, then we take precaution and we don't go all the way in emissions and so on, we don't emit anymore, we stop emissions until we know for sure that it's not damaging the environment. I guess the American approach would be totally the opposite, right? We first emit as much as we can and then if there's some damage we will handle it, right? Isn't that typical American versus typical German? I would say so. And it has, it's so <coughs> important in Germany, it has influenced the European Union and the French at some point, they, they wanted to Incorporated into the French constitution, but they then stop. It's too German. Now, but it's um, th there is something. Well, let's continue. Uh, Atomausstieg. I think we are the only, or the, maybe not the only, but one of the few um, developed nations who completely shunned nuclear energy, and it seems to all of us including me, totally natural and logical and rational. But to many others from outside, it seems crazy. 
you're, you're, you're renouncing the cleanest and most efficient energy, right? And risk, yeah, there are risks, but there are always risks. That's how the rest sees it. Um, or uh, genetically modified organisms. We don't like it. Right? Many others say well, it's a solution to, to many problems of the world. Uh, genetic research, to be fair, I think that has also something to do with our history, uh, the Third Reich, but I'll, I'll come back to that as well. Now, here is um, risk or uncertainty avoidance, risk avoidance in the stock market. Mr. Gephardt has mentioned that I'm particularly interested in that. And indeed, in that area, you can see that Germany is, is very different. And they speak, uh, um, stockbrokers, they speak of the risk-averse Germans. So in global average, the global average um, of investors invests 35% in stocks, right? Uh, whereas the Germans, only 19%. And it's estimated that, and we do this, of course, because, uh, like my mother-in-law always says, who's, who's going on the stock market, uh, he's playing lottery, right? You cannot predict it, and uh, you will lose money eventually, so we don't do it, right? And that's a typical German attitude, and it costs us a lot of money, right? Um, it is, uh, you see here, the worldwide assets in trillions, and it's always going up. And the German assets are more or less staying the same. And that economists at least say that's because we don't invest in the stock market because we are risk averse. But there is also another uh, um, part of the story. We are long term oriented. We look into the long term. We have in accounting, in Handelsgesetzbuch, we have the true and fair view. That's our principle of accounting. It's not the American principle of accounting. The American <laughs> principle of accounting is um, make it most attractive for investors, right? For us, it's more like prudence, be prudent. Um, then we have the concept of, I think that's typical German, der ehrbare Kaufmann. You can find this in commentaries on the commercial court always. Der Erbach, he does, the, the honorable merchant does this and does not this. So, and that, that's the standard of behavior that you have to follow in commercial law, the honorable merchant. <coughs> then another thing that shows that we are oriented toward, towards uh, stability is we still demand for the GmbH 25,000 euros. I know we now have Unternehmensgesellschaft, which you can start with one euro, but for a real limited company, we have, we demand 25,000 euros. The French, for instance, uh, one euro. Totally sufficient for an SARL. Um, we have very high quality requirements for products. Also interesting, um, we have a prohibition of compound interest. You know what compound interest is? Interest paid on interest. So if you, if you take out a loan, like for 5%, and, and um, you have an arrear of 10,000 euros per year, um, then, and you don't pay the interest, right? then in many countries of the world, including France, especially the US, of course, and the US, and the UK, interest, you have to pay interest not only on the outstanding capital, but also on the interest that you're still owing. So, uh, you pay interest on interest, compound interest, and that, of course, increases the debt enormously over time and makes people or um, makes people become indebted. And when I found out recently with a banking colleague from France, he asked me, like, what about compound interest in Germany? He said, prohibited. He was totally astonished. He said, what? I thought you are a liberal country. And I said, it's more complicated than that. It's not as simple as we are illiberal or liberal. Um, things are more complicated. I think it's, it, it's about values, and values are part of culture. Now, here is a Gerd Hofstede comparing um, the cultural dimensions of Germany and the United States. And um, well, I don't want to talk about masculinity because I still don't understand what. It really means that that's not possible that Germany is more masculine than the United States. But what I definitely, what I definitely believe, 
What I definitely believe is that we are more long-term oriented, and you can see it here. I mean, it's, it's just fascinating, right? And then the US is more individualist, everybody would agree with that as well, I would say. But what I also find interesting is indulgence. We are not indulging. And that's part of, part of our problem, of, for our, our economists keep saying we should, we should spend more and not save so much. Right? So we are not indulging enough. <coughs> and here, that's the, next, um, that's the next slide, restraint versus indulgence. How many times have you heard about die Schwäbische Hausfrau? Die Schwäbische Hausfrau. Every economist tells you it's absolute nonsense. Right? If you want to earn something in the long term, you need to make a big investment. And for making an investment, you have to take out a loan. But if you follow Ms. Merkel and the Schwäbische Haus, you never take a loan. You only spend what you have, right? You can never spend more than you have. If we would always do that, we could never acquire a house. A railway could never be built. An autobahn could never be built. Of course, you have to take uh, loans. But that's part of our culture um, to say, well, we can only spend what we have, right? Isn't it? And that is seen as something morally reprehensible. And I think this man has something to do with it. Uh, Mr. Gebhardt said that I have been working at the University of Halle-Wittenberg, and there he had a certain, a certain influence, right? And he, what was his fight with the Pope about? It was the, about the way that the Pope was financing the St. Peter's Dome, right? And he did that. And that's interesting, with the Ablassbriefe, which are called in English, indulgences. <laughs> Isn't it interesting? So, uh, he paid that, but also with a lot of debt. And, um, and Luther, Luther took issue with that, and he said, you cannot, you cannot finance such a, a secular building with debt or, and indulgences. Took issue with that, that he, the Pope was spending too much more than he had. And that, I think... Either it was already part of the German culture, I don't know whether that was already, or it took hold with the uh, Protestant um, Reformation. You see it in other contexts, I, I just mentioned in passing, the Schwarze Null, of course, um, also a fetish of, of Germany, um, the, the clash with the Greek over the bailout. I think it was more a cultural clash than a real economic clash. Because the Greeks, they never understood, why don't you, why don't you give us a little money? We, you are so rich, right? And we are in a crisis. And we, what we did instead of giving money, we taught them lessons about, you should not spend more than you have, right? We told them how to do it. And they said, but we are starving, we are in a crisis. And we said, no, no, but you should not spend, you have spent more than you should. And that's really a cultural clash. I think that was not enough understood. And the same thing is happening right now with the EU budget, where again the Germans are not ready to open up their wallets. But I think it's not because we are not in favor of the EU, or it's not because we don't have solidarity. It's just because of our cultural conviction that it's not good to spend more than you have. We have certainly a, a preference for um, small and medium enterprises over um, big businesses, which you can see in many, in many legal rules. For instance, um, I, I know of no other developed country which that extends its, its control of unfair terms, where the judge looks into the contract and says, this term is unfair, so it will be struck out. <coughs> I know of no other country that does this also in relation between two businesses. And why do we do? And that's indeed how unfair uh, terms control started in Germany in the 1930s. It started not as a protection for the consumer, as it is today mostly. It started as a protection of small enterprises against big um, groups of companies. So groups of companies is something that is totally um, well. The German is typically afraid of big groups of companies. Right? Recently, I went. Um, with my partner into a um, bio store and she wanted to buy a hair shampoo and was no longer there. 
and she she asked the owner of the shop why why don't you have this hair shampoo anymore? And she said because it's now the, the, the brand is now owned by L'Oréal, a concern, and she used the word like concern, like something bad. And indeed, concern has a I think a little bit of a negative connotation, hasn't it? In Germany, concern sounds threatening. But what it means, if you translate in other languages, is just a group of companies. Group of companies, I think, doesn't, doesn't really sound threatening in the US, but concern sounds threatening in German. And that's why we have introduced also, as one of the few countries in the world, we have introduced a liability of companies, <laughs> of the parent company for the subsidiaries of, um, of the group. You don't have that, for instance, in Switzerland, nor do you have it in France. And then, of course, co-determination. Co-determination, <coughs> I said it means involving stakeholders, uh, which is good, but when does it apply? It applies fully only if you have more than 2,000 employees. So it's directed against big companies, mostly. The small uh, company owner, he doesn't need to involve his employees, really. Not in the same way, at least. And then... Now it gets a little bit more uh, tricky. I think we also have a preference for the tangible. That is shown by the fact that we have relatively few stock investments, but that's also related to the risk aversion. But it's also shown in the fact that uh, we have many, we are a manufacturing country. We don't have a really, we are not a services nation, nor do we develop software or anything like that. But what it also, or I think the strongest proof is, is really that we use, we all have a lot of cash in our wallets. I will not ask you how much cash you have in your wallet, but um, the average German has in his wallet 103 euros. Frenchman only 32 um, euros. And you can see that if you go to an ATM in France <laughs> and you want to withdraw money, it only suggests you like ridiculous amounts of money. Uh, 10, 20, maximum like 50 euros, right? Never 100, 200, 500 like in Germany. And my, my French uh, colleagues are always astonished why I carry around with me like 100 euros. I say, well, why do you have so much cash? It's because you're German, you are rich. That's not the reason. It's not the reason, actually, we are not rich. Uh, if you compare it to other countries, it's because we prefer the cash. Uh, and I think that can be explained a little bit by our preference for the tangible. I'll come back to that. Now, I, I said I will, I will have to bother you with a little bit of law. And, uh, well, that comes now, that part. <coughs> so, I said that we are, we prefer tangible and we prefer uh, manufacturing. How can you see that in the law? Where, where do we actually prefer manufacturing businesses? And that's like a well, complicated case law that every law student has to learn and every law student uh, has to suffer. But uh, I will show it to you nevertheless. So imagine, and that frequently happened in Germany, um, a manufacturer produces let's say cars, right? And then he has a claim against um, his customers. Now this claim is very worthwhile because it may take a long time until the customer pays, but in the meantime, the manufacturer needs money, right? Needs uh, money to finance his business. What does he do? He usually goes to a bank and gets a loan, but the, the bank wants security in return. So the manufacturer, he assigns all of his claims against, the cust against all customers to the bank. That's a standard transaction. Assignment means it, the, the manufacturer transfers all the claims to the bank so that the bank now becomes the creditor. Okay, now what then happened, and still frequently happens, is there is somebody who supplies parts to the car manufacturer, for instance, brakes. Right, or engines. And the supplier, well, also wants to get paid and wants to have some security for the payment of the parts. 
right? The manufacturer cannot immediately pay. So the supplier retains the title of uh, the brakes, so the, the ownership of the brakes, but that's not really worthwhile because the brakes will be built into the car and then sold, so it's gone. But what the, supp the supplier foresees all of this and he says, well, and once they, my brakes are built into your car, you assign all the claims against your customers to me. And the manufacturer also signs this clause. Notwithstanding the fact that he has pre previously assigned all of the claims to the bank. So what happens then is there is a conflict. Assuming the manufacturer goes bankrupt, there will be a conflict between the bank and the supplier over who owns the claim against the customer. So far everybody followed or is it too... Yeah? Okay. So, and how is this solved? Well, legally, legally there is a, a very, simple, um, very simple rule. You cannot transfer more than you have. So once that the manufacturer has transferred everything to the bank, you could not tr um, assign it a second time to the supplier. So the supplier loses. Right? And the bank wins. Now in this case, the supplier nevertheless brought an action to the German courts and the German courts looked at the situation <coughs> and they said, yeah, true, yeah, the, the bank should win normally, but it's somehow unfair, right? The poor manufacturer, he does something really worthwhile. He produces something, but does the bank just gives money, right? And the bank would always win in this situation because the, the blanket assignment always comes first, usually. You start with the bank relation until you get um, part supplied. So that's not fair. And they um, invented a case law which we call now Collision des verlängerten Eigentumsvorbereits mit der Globalzession. That's a German name. Sounds very breathtaking. But the simple, the sim the simple thing is the, the objective is to, to protect the supplier, okay? And they say, they say, and the, the, the legal instrument that they found was, they say, it's against good morals, interestingly enough, it's against good morals that the bank takes all the claims for itself, and not only those claims that it really needs to secure its uh, credit. So they say the assignment, the blanket assignment is void if it exceeds the uh, volume of the secured loan by more than 150%. Okay? And in that way, some of the claims become free and go to the supply. It's elegant, it's wonderful, it's unique, right? But it's unique to Germany. No other country I know of has thought of protecting the supply in this way. I mean, ask an English lawyer what he would say about it. I would say, of course the banks win this, right? The banks own it and they, there's no way that you would get around it. But we have found an instrument to protect uh, our suppliers because we, I think, like what they're doing and we prefer them a little bit over banks. And why is that? I think, and that, I really think, that has cultural rules. Um, I'm... I have here a picture of Hans Sachs from Meistersinger uh, von Nürnberg. And I mean, already the notion, a master, right? A Meister in German has something to do with manufacturing. That's the honest way of earning your money is to produce something tangible, right? If, you're, if you would say to your mother, what do you want to become? And I, you would say, I want to become a banker, she would probably say, do something honest, right? Earn it, earn it, do something useful for society. And that also is reflected in this uh, poll by Allensbacher about the <coughs> social prestige of different professions. And I was a little bit shocked that the professor is only, you know, on the seventh or eighth position here, way below the doctor. Right, it was 76 percent, and because only 26. But then I was relieved when I saw, okay, Rechtsanwalt, much lower, lawyer, uh, entrepreneur, interesting, very low, and then the lowest is not politician, but moderator on TV. That's why I'm astonished why, but banker, 
banker is definitely the lowest in social prestige that you can have in Germany. And I actually, I don't even know why, because the bankers didn't do as much harm to our economy as they did, for instance, to the US economy or the UK economy, if they had this, this idea. They did some uh, harm, but not as much, right? Our bankers are rather civilized bankers, I would say, in comparison to other countries. But they have a very, very low esteem. And now I come to a very, well, um, difficult part of, of my story. And that's in um, a book by Gustav Freider. Who has ever uh, read that? Ah, you have read it. Okay, so... Um, Debit and Credit, Soll und Haben. It's, it was one of the favorite books of the 19th century, and it describes a um, young man of Polish Jewish origin who is very versatile and knowledgeable in financial instruments, in um, negotiable bills, and things like that. And um, indentures and all these instruments and he lures uh, Germans, proper Germans of German origin, aristocrats, people of nobility into signing deeds whereby they transfer and ultimately lose their property. Right? And that was of course totally anti-Semitic. And uh, it was connected a book connected, connecting um, Polish Jewish people directly to finance and uh, the bad influence that had on Germany and the fate of Germans. And it's a, it's a well-known story that the Nazis exploited um, the fact that many uh, Jewish people were working in banks for their cause. But I think, and while it's difficult of course to, to, um, to prove that, but I think um, there is a something that is even older, I don't know whether it's older than anti-Semitism, but there is a point that they exploited that Germans thought bad anyway about people who were working in finance and not producing something, uh, not manufacturing something, right? And then that connecting that with, uh, um, with Jewish people helped, I think, anti-Semitism a lot. Okay, but that's maybe a, a strong thesis and, and you can argue with me about that <laughs> later. So now I will just give some uh, brief uh, overviews of how I see other legal systems. But that's very, very superficial because I didn't do... I know, of course, German law, although I do comparative law, I know German law best. And there I think I can see the underlying tendencies or the culture better than in other systems. But if I look at the U at US law, you see that they embrace risk in, in lots of ways, whether it is in, in research or whether it is or in environmental law or whether it is in finance. In fact, the US is the only country I came across where they really think they have ways to manage risk. The whole idea of derivatives and these financial products that we call that we call in Germany speculative are for them not speculative. They are ways of dealing with risk, of shifting risks to those who can best bear it. Right. So they, it's not <coughs> the discussion. Of course, is you could just say, well, all of this, uh, these financial products in the U.S. That's a product of greed of big bankers on Wall Street who want to make money. But I think there's a deeper, a deeper story. And a deeper story is that U.S. citizens, and correct me if I'm wrong, right, they're deeply optimistic about the future and they think they can handle it, even if it's risky, right? And we don't have this optimism, I think. And I culturally, but that is certainly, uh, Peter will correct me on this, may have something to do with the fact that they settled to a totally new continent and there you needed a little bit of optimism and pragmatism to go forward. France is um, for me a very difficult story because on the one hand there are lots of state interventions in the economy. I can see that in many, in many ways if you just see um, 
Um, the Cour de Travail is, is the usual discussion point in France, almost now 4,000 pages long, um, the labor law code. But also on other subjects that are dear to our French friends, like the Code of Rural, uh, of Agriculture, it's like also 3,000 uh, pages long. And uh, that's, that's one point. But again, that's not the whole story. They are much more wary of interfering with contracts. Um, they have a tradition of um, judicial restraint when it comes to controlling terms of the contract or um, changing terms of the contract. Much more difficult than in Germany. And what I see there is um, they are, at the, on the one hand, I would correct, and that's probably, uh, uh, you will criticize this, but at the, at the one hand, I think uh, French people are very individualist, but at the same time, also, uh, they believe in the state. And that is because their belief in the state is that they don't think like the Americans think, well, the state is something, it's the government, and the government is against us, and we have to do something against, to restrain the government. I think the French <coughs> idea is more, the, the government is the collective us, and we can influence something, if we take control, even the economy, we can steer the economy to our needs if we, um, if we influence the state. And I think that's very much um, the heritage of the French Revolution, which was on the one hand oriented to preserving and protecting individual liberties, but on the other hand also acknowledging that you can only protect uh, individual liberties in real life if you act collectively against those who are in power. Now, Switzerland, finally, um, of course, although it's very close culturally to Germany and, and also geographically very close, very different when it comes to banks and finance, right? And also, when you look a little bit into its contract law, it has very little protection for weaker parties, Contracts are in, mm, interpreted strictly. And I would culturally, I would link that to a preference for predictability, but really to, re to be able to rely on the letter of the law. And I, I would, I still am totally open to other suggestions. I only present here preliminary conclusions of what I think. But why are the, uh, the Swiss like that? I think they have lived in, a, in very stable circumstances. For the last hundreds of years, they didn't have uh, revolutions and wars in the same way, or they were not affected by them in the same way as we were. If it had been, they would have maybe developed in small instruments for dealing with um, social upheavals and change. Now, to take out a little bit of the discussion, I just want to present some counter arguments that you will <coughs> probably make, or May, may, but you will have certain laws of others, I'm sure. So, one counter argument could be uh, but regulation is such a technocratic question, um, it hasn't to do anything to do with culture. I think it nevertheless reflects cultural values. Uh, for instance, we have this nice um, instrument in France, the déséquilibre significatif, which means when there is an um, significant imbalance between the two performances of two parties of the contract, then um, you can annul the contract and you are even liable for damages. And so if I, um, let's say I buy um, your car for um, 10 euros, not only is the, car, is the contract void, but uh, I will also be have to pay you damages. If the, the car is no longer available at some point. And not because I was fraudulent or something, but because there was a significant imbalance. I think that's culturally for Germans very difficult to digest, and, and it's also an obstacle for harmonization, but I'll come back to that. Um, <coughs> you could also say, well, but regulation ultimately is dependent, is the result of political decisions. It's not the culture, it's the political decision if there is, you know, if Bernie Sanders wins in the U.S., the U.S. will probably have uh, more 
socialist roots than, than France and Germany, right? I don't think so, that it's really, uh, there is, that there is this broad way of change that can be brought about by politics. Politics only works within a certain framework of the discussion, and some things that we think are uh, natural are not even discussed in the United States, and vice versa. So there is a, a, a way of thinking, a framework of the discussion that determines politics, and that's, for me, culture. Then you could make the point, well, we live in a globalizing society, and anyway, it's all becoming the same. You have so many people uh, moving around from other countries, so how can you claim that, uh, that there's some, there is something uh, like culture? <coughs> True, to a certain extent, but law is made, law is made mainly by states. And states function according to certain modes, and, um, and these modes are still very much determined by tradition, attitudes, values. Um, migrants need time to make their way into a certain um, system, legal system or political system, and by the time they have gotten there, they may have adopted and assumed so much of the culture of the country and may need to do that also to, to uh, win an election that they are no longer very different from those who are living in, the, in this culture. Uh, and I think that the, the, the populist movements around the world that we have seen within the last years, um, last two or three years only, uh, shows a little bit that there are marked differences and that people uh, value those differences and don't, and that they are not overcome so easily. And finally, I think that's, that's a, also a big counter argument. Well, what I'm doing here is mainly, it's probably mainly confirming my own stereotypes, right? I'm acting with a bias. I have my opinion made up about Germany, France, uh, France is really true, but US and Switzerland beforehand. And now I'm looking for uh, legal rules that confirm that. Well, true, I'm, what I'm, but I, I want to distinguish two things very clearly. What I'm not doing is I'm not characterizing the French or the American, because I know, of course, you know, the, the individuals are very different, mm -hmm. very, very different. And um, what I'm looking at is merely the law. So the spirit, as Montesquieu said, the spirit of the law the mentality of the law, the way, the, the pattern of thinking behind the law. And that may be an ancient way, because law is adapted or is adopted over a period of time. It's never made in one day. And these uh, ways of thinking from other centuries, they are still embodied in the law. Even if today the population is already very different, we have what I would call latency, or time lag between um, the state of the law, as it is in the books now, and a modernizing um, view that expresses the, the current moves of society. So that takes some time, and it doesn't necessarily say something about Swiss or French people, what their law looks like. Right? I would make this distinction. So, what is the outcome of all of this? <clears throat> I think that a cultural approach is to regulation is helpful in, in, in different respects. First of all, it helps uh, answering my uh, question at the outset, why capitalist economies are different, and it gives a, a really a deeper answer than just say, well, we have different regulations. It also tries to answer, why do we have different regulations? In that way, it goes beyond the, the paradigms of economics, which just holds well, some countries are underdeveloped and have, have not yet realized uh, the beauty of the full capitalist system, right? It, sh it shows why Swedish, French, and German capitalism is different. And it sh also helps reveal other values besides efficiency. Um, especially stability, sustainability, maybe even equality. And what we see um, well, I think economists should look as well more into 
No, and we as comparative lawyers, we are forced a little bit in, to look into the reality of other um, cultures, and we, we are struck by the differences that we found that we find. Whereas economists look at this from a more distant point, and they would be well informed to look at the practicalities of law because law is informed by the needs and um, the attitudes of of a certain country and how it is solved. So that's why I think comparative lawyers are more aware of the differences than economists usually are. And finally, I think this also has some impact for the harmonization and globalization uh, movements. I think every, anybody who wants to harmonize different laws is well, is well advised to not only look at the letter of the law, um, or at the size of the economy or other economic data, it's, it's very worthwhile to also look um, into the culture and see that states are interested in some and very attached to certain rules, like we in Germany, for instance, co determination. Although all economists around the world tell us economically it's, it's useless, it's senseless, uh, and you're the only country who has it, so why do you have it? I think every or Almost everybody here would like to keep it. And that's something that's culturally, has become culturally ingrained, even if it only exists since the 1970s in Germany. And, um, well, <coughs> we have to respect that. And if the European Union wants to harmonize company law, they always have to look at this, at this German tradition and just say, you know, we wipe it out. It will not work or will create another backlash. Thank you very much for your attention. <coughs>